welcome. I am Esra Akjan, the director of the Institute for European Studies at the Ainadi Center for International Studies at Cornell University. Thank you for joining our webinar, Germany to Germany, New Perspectives on Post-War, Post-Unification and Post-Colonial Reparations. Before we start, let me extend my thanks to our program manager, Pamela Hampton, uh, and our new administrative assistant, Jason Ford, who will be guiding his first webinar today. So I hope it goes very well, Jason. And let me also thank our student workers and ambassadors, Alp Demirolu, Meili Bergs, Natalia Gulik, and uh, Andrew Lim, who help with the social media posts, graphic design, and student participation for our events. This seminar is organized as part of our migration series that has been continuing since fall 2017 and bringing together panels to understand the historical and contemporary relevance of migration and to critically acknowledge Europe's role in the history of modernization and colonization, as well as its character as an immigrant continent. The theme of our series in this academic year is repair and reparations. We hope to think together about several aspects of this theme in today's context, as the question of reparations has a newfound relevance in the United States with the Black Lives Matter movement, and as the question of multifaceted healing has become urgent around the world with the current public health and related crisis, and moreover, as the question of repairs from climate change related disasters continues to loom in our planet's future. The multidisciplinary panels in the series bring together scholars and professionals to discuss the topics of repair, reparation, restitution, and transitional justice by drawing from the past and present experiences of Europe in a global context. So far, we have organized the panels, Hagia Sophia, Perspectives from Cultural Heritage, Beirut Reconstructions, repatriation of museum objects, and Belgium to Congo, colonialism reparation and truth and reconciliation commissions. Our future panels this spring will be USSR to post-Soviet Russia, reparations or repression for Stalin's victims, North to South, repair reparations for climate refugees, and EU to Bosnia, refugee reparations and global apartheid. So please follow us and attend those panels as well. Today's panel bring, brings together scholars who provide new perspectives on the historical and pending reparations in the eras after colonization, Nazism and communism in Germany, as well as the significance of these restitutions in serving as a model for transitional justice and international law. We will explore both material and moral reparations, such as return and restitution of property that had been confiscated, monetary payments as compensation, and educational steps to take responsibility for the past. The panel will not only acknowledge these reparations to ex-citizens and refugees, but also question the limits of established formulas and the lack or inequality of restitutions through the history of today's Germany. In an agreement reached in 1952, West Germany approved to make restitutions and monetary reparations to the Jewish victims of Nazism. Additionally, the country took several educational steps and moral reparations that served as models for transitional justice and international law. While East Germany refused accountability in 1952, claiming it did not bear moral or historical responsibility to the crimes of the Nazis, the state agreed to reverse this policy in 1988. The memorable image of Willy Brandt kneeling down in a dramatic apology in Warsaw in 1970 has recently sparked new debates on reparations. After the dissolution of East Germany and the two Germany's reunification, authorities discussed reparations for property seized by com the communists for the past four decades. Only recently in 2015, the official deliberation started for a consensus over the history of and an apology for the German pre-Nazi genocide in Southwest Africa. The collective memory debate in Germany uh, and its repercussions, say in this country, in the United States, has often been competitive 
as if different groups of victims need to compete with each other in their struggle over scarce resources, and as if recognizing and taking accountability for the oppression of one group would take away these rights from another. While Holocaust has often been declared unique among genocides and Nazis among perpetrators, it can and it has served as a model for the mobilization of other material and moral reparations in unexpected places of the world. Its confrontation has sometimes helped, at other times impaired, the articulation of other horrors and the recognition of other victims. Moreover, the early Holocaust memory actually took shape in dialogue with the anti-racist and anti-colonial struggles of intellectuals such as Hannah Arendt, W.E.B. Du Bois, and Charlotte Delbo, as scholar Michael Rothberg has convincingly analyzed. Andreas Houston has also famously traced the beginnings of this memory discourse and the growing awareness of Holocaust to decolonization and the civil rights movements. This summer, the Black Lives Matter protests that were concurrently held in Germany and other parts of Europe rebrought these matters to the attention of the international public and reminded the need for socializing justice. For example, as part of today's series at IES, we organized Belgium to Congo webinar in February to gain more insights to the recently established special commission after these protests, which could eventually bring colonialism reparations that would be a first in the official history of transitional justice. We also organized repatriation of museum objects webinar in October to discuss repatriation and restitution as a form of reparation to colonized lands. What is the responsibility of museums to objects taken into their collections by violence or deceit during the colonial times? It might be useful to remember that there are approximately 75,000 objects from Sub-Saharan Africa in public museums of Germany. The relations between Holocaust memory, xenophobia, and the reception of Muslim immigrants in Germany after the 1970s have been no less complex and changing. Many immigrants compared racism against them to anti-Semitism, such as the neo-Nazis' deadly attacks in Mönn and Solingen. And many Middle Eastern immigrants took the German Jewish trope as a model for their own cooperative unions, associations, and demands for rights. In literary studies, Leslie Adelson has analyzed Holocaust consciousness and accountability in German-Turkish immigrant lit literature after Germany's reunification. Esra Özyürek has drawn our attention to the fact that this situation changed in the 2000s when, quote, the interconnected commitments of European leaders to fight anti-Semitism became one of the grounds for legitimizing the racialization of immigrants and signaling out the Muslims as the main contemporary anti-Semites, end of quote. So another indication of the competitive memory is the implied ranking of suffering due to unequal monetary resources, scale, and scale granted to different reparations and memorials. Comparing Holocaust memorials to other apology structures, many commented on the lack or insufficiency in the commemoration of other Nazi victims, such as the Roma and homosexual populations. All these, and of course, many other examples from Germany alone, point to the fact that struggles for transitional justice in general and accountability and reparations in particular have sometimes blocked, but other times learned from each other. One group's struggle for the recognition of pain could actually inspire and guide in others. It could help devise mechanisms of truth-telling, confrontation, and non-recurrence, including survival testimonies, naming of the crimes, memorials, educational programs, repatriation protocols for cultural heritage, um, Transition norms and never again movements. We are gathered in this panel today to discuss post-war, post-unification and pending post-colonial reparations in Germany, not to blur the distinctions between the three or not to rank suffering, but to see if and how this dialogue can build solidarities, identify double standards, if any, and work towards our overcoming them. Given that Germany, has often served as a model for the elaboration of transitional justice mechanisms, both for its crimes and reparations. We will start with Ruti Taitel's uh, presentation, who will speak more broadly about transitional justice and Germany's place in it. 
We will continue with Rebecca Burley, who will share her insights on the panel's questions from the perspective of her own scholarly work on memory and history and German denazification as transitional justice. We will then hear from Nick Mulder, whose work on property expropriations and the role of confiscation on the income and wealth distribution will add the economic dimension to the debates on accountability and taking responsibility for the past wounds. Finally, we will hear from Tiffany Florville, whose work on African Black diaspora in Germany, Black internationalism, and the history of the Black German movement of the 1980s to 2000s will offer insights on the pending material and moral reparations in Germany's coming to terms with its colonial past. Before I introduce the procedure for today's panel, let me acknowledge that this event is organized by Cornell University that is located on the lands of the Cayuga Nation. The Cayuga Nation is part of the alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic, historic and contemporary presence on this land. They precede the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. I acknowledge the painful history of this possession and honor the ongoing connection of the Cayuga Nation's people, past and present, to these lands and waters. And let me now introduce the procedure for the discussion today. Each of our four speakers will make a 15-minute presentation. Upon conclusion of this part, there will be a discussion uh, and a Q&A when I will make a selection of questions submitted from the attendees. You will be able to submit your questions for this portion by writing them in the Q&A tool that you can find at the bottom of your screen. Given the large size of the attendees, please make your questions direct, short, and on topic, and please refrain from writing your reactions or impressions so that I can sort through the posts efficiently. We hope to conclude the panel in much less than two and a half hours in total. So I'm very much looking forward to the presentations and the following discussion, and I thank our speakers very much for accepting my invitation. And now let me introduce our first speaker. Ruta Teitel uh, is the Ernst Stiefel Professor of Comparative Law at New York Law School, an internationally recognized authority on international law, international human rights, transitional justice, and comparative constitutional law she has published several books, including her path-breaking work, Transitional Justice, as well as Globalizing Transitional Justice and Humanities Law. Her scholarly writing has been published in many book chapters and law reviews, including Cornell International Law Journal and in Global Policy, which won uh, this journal's Best Article Prize. Professor Teitel has lectured around the world uh, and is affiliated with NYU's International Relations Program and is also a distinguished research scholar at Columbia University. She's the founding co-chair of the American Society of International Law, Interest Group on Transitional Justice and Rule of Law, and is also a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, Lucy, it's just it. The screen is yours. Thank you so much. And it's a great pleasure to uh, join you for this ambitious panel, which is part of this wonderful series that uh, Cornell has, uh, has uh, pioneered. I'm a graduate of Cornell Law School, so uh, it would have been nice to be in person, but uh, uh, at least we're engaging uh, uh, through the university uh, as well right now and hope uh, at some other time to be there in person. So what I'd like to do, and obviously it's, uh, I'm st opening the panel uh, with some of the themes of transitional justice, which is, uh, as I define it, the conception of justice in periods of political change. Um, as, as it has developed into a field, uh, we've seen anticipatory transitional justice as well as long postponed transitional justice as societies reckon with their past uh, and seek to move, move forward in a different way. So what I'd like to do is uh, talk about um, several stages of transitional justice where Germany has played a, an important role. And um, you know, without a doubt, uh, as a country, it, it has uh, played a, a hugely significant part in uh, the uh, conceptualization of transitional justice. 
So I'm going to identify uh, four phases, um, the post-World War I uh, phase where uh, Germany ended up uh, paying the reparations for the total war, uh, the po post-World War II, which was already referenced by Ezra in her opening remarks, uh, where Germany is known for having uh, paid significant reparations to both Israel and to diasporic uh, victims organizations, post-communism, and lastly, uh, the return of issues of post-colonialism. And this is an unfinished uh, chapter around the world, and I know Tiffany will probably address this uh, in her own uh, remarks. So uh, just let me uh, pull up the, the slides I prepared uh, and see uh, if I can uh, uh, do this uh, through my slides. Um, okay, so uh, transitional justice, as we've uh, discussed, a term that uh, ends up, um, you know, I end up ident being identified with the term in the 1990s. Um, and that was a huge a moment for transitional justice, the post-Cold War uh, moment. And uh, there we saw both um, the end of dirty wars in Latin America, as well as post-communism in the uh, collapse of Soviet bloc. Uh, and that would have uh, effects on civil wars and conflict throughout the world, including South Africa. So you have both the center and the periphery and uh, enormous developments then. Uh, and, um, you know, Germany obviously played a role in the uh, post-communist moment. But let me take you to a more historical moment. And really, uh, no discussion of reparations uh, would be complete without referencing the end of World War I uh, and the, uh, the treaty there, the Treaty of Peace, um, uh, Treaty of Versailles. And, um, and this was a, a moment of uh, traditional international law reparations, which is state to state, uh, where the allies um, uh, made Germany sign a treaty where it would be responsible for the entire cost of the war. And it the, the relevant clause was called the total war guilt uh, clause. And, um, and, you know, by some historians, this is the arrangement that uh, not only did not deter uh, further uh, aggression, but some historians attribute the path to World War II uh, in this uh, onerous, in these onerous reparations, uh, which uh, Germany had to pay. And then later uh, in, you know, you see in war, pre-war pre propaganda starting in the 1930s, where Germany starts exacting uh, uh, capital from uh, banks uh, that they say are owned by Jews, et cetera, et cetera, and, and trying to figure out uh, Hitler uh, starts the victimization of Germany, the narrative of victimization, you know, that in here's, he says, in this post-war moment. Um, so the next phase, obviously, is uh, post-World War II. Uh, and again, um, this is, uh, you know, Zoom history, shall we say, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in very broad brush. But the themes of World War II and the Nuremberg trials are, are well known. Uh, but it's important that, um, that to note that often the, the reparatory history is often overshadowed by the punitive uh, history telling. And so we tend to remember the emphasis on individual responsibility uh, and attribution of, of um, uh, criminal uh, level uh, li uh, responsibility. But there was also the other uh, more fluid understanding which goes to the relationship of the individual and the collective. And this was also present in the Nuremberg Charter where um, you have uh, the official uh, responsibility of defendants responsible for acts that they you know, were overseeing. You also have the fact that at, at Nuremberg, there are uh, corporations that are held responsible, three out of the six, including the Gestapo, uh, the SS would be held criminally responsible uh, at Nuremberg, and then uh, there would be the use of, um, of membership in those organizations in order to hold individuals responsible. So the use of conspiracy, the law of conspiracy, which is a bit like RICO today, 
um, all, all goes to show that there was a, another understanding, uh, um, a fluid understanding of the fact that these crimes uh, could not be committed without, uh, without both uh, individuals and groups. Uh, and, uh, and so you have a very, um, you know, uh, if you will, uh, uh, an interrogation of those two questions uh, at Nuremberg. Now, the themes that I want to emphasize throughout the, the rest of the presentation is really, you know, first this law versus politics. And, the, you know, to be sure, the trials were, were um, instigated by the Allies. Uh, they were not, uh, you know, voluntary from the German part. But then you would have the continuation of the criminal justice policy uh, take it, assumed by Germany through its national trials. And that would start uh, uh, once Germany regained sovereignty. Uh, and, and, uh, and those trials uh, continue today. There have been, tr uh, there's now uh, trials of, um, of guards at the camps and also most recently of a secretary at the camps. Those were co continuously extended uh, uh, and given that crimes against humanity have no statute of limitations, Germany would assume this. Uh, this responsibility and its view that um, the idea of individual responsibility and in particular, as we're seeing, or, you know, lower level border guards, the idea of, um, of not following orders uh, as a defense, the rejection of that defense, this continues to be part of German education. And one can see the use of these trials uh, in a pedagogic, as part of a pedagogic project uh, there. Now, I, I want to turn to the rep reparatory part, uh, which is the uh, also, you know, as I said, this theme of law of, uh, versus politics, the collective versus the individual, and, um, and past and future. And, and these, these themes uh, uh, really resonate throughout these various phases of, of German history. So, um, uh, even today, we have ongoing reparations uh, by Germany to Israel and to uh, representative organizations. As mentioned early in, in the introduction, since 1952, but earlier as well, 1952 is the Luxembourg Agreement, but you have earlier reparations to individuals uh, before that in the 1940s. So you have an extensive history um, uh, and, and, and it's negotiated. Um, uh, and again, this theme of political negotiation, uh, Adenauer negotiated with representatives of, of the new state of Israel, uh, in this famous Luxembourg Agreement in 1952. And, um, and the idea uh, there uh, was, uh, um, and in part, you can see that the theme is, is state to state, that it's Germany to Israel. And, and this is very important because this picks up on themes of uh, traditional international law and the relations of states between uh, one another. In fact, uh, the reparations at the start, uh, Israel, uh, there were leaders that uh, you know, were against uh, accepting reparations. Um, and this, this is often true um, and has been debated in parts of Eastern Europe and in Latin America. There are different cultures about, uh, about reparations um, and the view that you know, would accepting these uh, monetary payments uh, uh, mean uh, that uh, the issue was over and that history would be closed. And, and in the end, uh, various statements by representatives of, of Israel went to this point and saying that no, these were important material reparations. Um, and I want to uh, turn to the next slide because I think it's interesting to note that they were called different, um, different uh, they, by different terms um, in, in different, um, uh, uh, by, in different nations. And so in Germany, it was known as Wiedergutmachung, uh, to make good again, uh, roughly speaking. Uh, here you have Menachem Begin protesting the agreement in 1952. Uh, in Israel, it was uh, Shilumim, uh, uh, which went more to uh, the uh, guilt uh, uh, of it. Uh, and, and I think the Wiedergutmachung also you know, points to this, uh, this theme 
as I mentioned, law, politics, a collective versus individual, and the third theme of the forward-looking aspect of reparations and the idea of repair and rep reparations as, um, you know, this Wieder Gutmachen goes to the future, the idea of something dynamic that would uh, hopefully help in uh, their future relations uh, with, uh, with Israel and with the world. Uh, so you have, um, uh, those themes uh, going forward in the 1950s. Um, and then you, you know, there's no uh, real official apology associated with those payments, but you have the famous knee fall uh, of Willy Brandt in 1970 uh, when he visits uh, the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial. And, um, and, you know, and this uh, also uh, would uh, produce an important reaction and is known as a, a model uh, of leaders taking responsibility, presidents, chancellors taking responsibility for the acts even of, of predecessor governments. Obviously that was the case here. Um, I think of, for example, um, other presidents, uh, Clinton uh, um, uh, responding uh, for acts of uh, the dirty war in Guatemala that was not under his watch. Uh, we could think of Obama as well uh, uh, in acknowledging the acts of the United States with respect to um, the dirty war in Argentina. So this has become also a, uh, a, a model of, um, of uh, uh, action uh, going forward. Um, so uh, this brings us to the, um, the uh, post uh, immediate post Cold War period. And there you start uh, getting uh, all kinds of further uh, activity, um, other, other new states that have broken off from the Soviet bloc start uh, uh, seeking reparations uh, from Germany and you have uh, ongoing uh, um, negotiations, particularly with Poland. Um, you also have a second round of uh, post-communist reparations um, with respect to, um, uh, sorry, uh, with respect to uh, Holocaust survivors that had been left out of the Luxembourg Agreement. So it was it was clear that the post Cold War moment would reopen questions. There were also questions of land. Uh, um, you know, Poland as a you know kind of renewed state. Issues of restitution abound in the early 1990s. Uh, so that would became a very uh, dynamic period for uh, re-raising uh, some of these issues. Now, Germany, as much as possible, wanted to stick to the earlier agreements. And as I said, you know, they, they said that Poland had uh, agreed in 1953. So, you know, again, this idea of state to state and, and Germany very concerned about the reopening of these questions. And you get that again in, um, in a famous case in the Inter International Court of Justice. Um, where slave labor uh, raised its head. Slave labor had not been uh, accounted for in the early 1950s agreements. And you had um, adjudications in Italy, for example, for slave labor uh, and Germany uh, took Italy to court uh, uh, claiming immunity and won uh, sovereign immunity from the suit in Italian courts. Um, so again, as I said, this, this wish to handle these questions through negotiation, through states, and in a forward-looking way that would uh, uh, go to diplomatic relations and the improvement of diplomatic relations. Um, there's, of course, the, uh, the um, uh, 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 internal, uh, the unification of Germany, uh, raised transitional justice issues. I don't have time to deal with all of these questions, but I think it's very important that, um, you know, and I know that denazification and some of the disqualification issues will be handled by some of the other speakers, but I think that the emphasis on uh, the, the uh, regulation of the Stasi records of the opening up of truth in the prior period, uh, really transitional justice uh, is not a formula. It goes to uh, particular responses that address the nature of re repression in the prior period and the attempt to draw a line and move to a different uh, point. And certainly with respect to totalitarianism, uh, the view was not 
to have official histories, but rather to allow citizens to, uh, to see their files, to privatize and have a freedom of information. And you can see that as very significant in the post-communist uh, period. Now, before I end, I want to point to the, to the, the model and the precedent uh, of, of uh, Germany with respect to human rights. Uh, and, uh, and here you can see very clearly uh, in the uh, uh, late 80s, you have the beginning of, of uh, contestation, victims uh, hitting the road uh, after amnesties or you know, complete silence in Latin America uh, during uh, periods of military rule. And, um, and they would bring these cases to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And Velasquez Rodriguez is the landmark case. It's also the first contested case in the Inter-American uh, Inter Court of Human Rights which is really the most active regional tribunal on the question of transitional justice and rights remedies. And in this landmark case, uh, as I said, it was for disappearances um, uh, in Honduras, um, the, uh, the conclusion of the court uh, was that the, the duty of the state is not just a duty of prevention, although of course that's the essential duty is to protect its citizens, right? That's the social contract. But the important uh, ongoing remedy uh, that the, the, the court recognized as a legal matter uh, so it's taking these political models uh, and uh, and uh, turning this into international human rights law. And in uh, the Velasquez Rodriguez case, the court says that the state has a legal duty not just to prevent, but to later, if if uh, a violation occurs, to investigate, to identify those responsible, to punish, and to ensure the victim adequate compensation. Now, many of these victims were no longer just like the victims of the Holocaust. The millions uh, of uh, Jews, uh, Russians, Polish, Roma, etc. And so uh, who is to be repaired? Well, the, the court recognizes next of kin, which is very significant and really builds on the uh, Holocaust model that uh, Germany had been pursuing. And in fact, I was privy to a meeting where there were representatives of Germany and representatives of Chile, uh, where Chile was deciding on its trans transitional justice, and we shared uh, the German uh, experience. Um, and Roberto Garreto Marino was there, and he said, that's what we're going to do. And he kind of shouted, it was an epiphany, and he put his headphones down, and he said that it would be very important for Chile to do that. And in fact, Chile didn't punish after uh, the end of the dirty war. They would end up having an, a, an elaborate reparations policy, including health care, education, uh, um, and, um, and repair, for, uh, including for those who had disappeared uh, you know, for some had re had come back who were victims of torture, but many had disappeared. Um, I want to end with the last stage here, which really references back to the beginning of the 20th century. And this is, um, you know, a, a, a hugely important, uh, and that is the, uh, the re-raising at the end of the Cold War, uh, 2004, the re-raising of the uh, first genocide of the 20th century of the Herero uh, by, 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 uh, and the Nam by Germany. Um, and you can see in this picture um, uh, uh, survivors and, and those who had been made slaves by uh, German uh, commanders uh, uh, von Trotta was the leader at that time. He was the one who, who uh, uh, came up with an extermination order that the men would be executed and the women and children would be led into the desert. And about 80,000 um, Herero died uh, uh, during this extermination campaign. And uh, and it was re-raised again because of the precedent of those who had been seeking reparatory justice and if you will, the what uh, some have called a justice cascade uh, at the beginning of the 21st century and the push for you know, uh, some sense of closure on the crimes of the 20th century. Um, I um, uh, saw uh, the artwork that's on the right. Um, you know, there is a South African artist, William Kentridge, who uh, created a multimedia opera um, which really challenges uh, German enlightenment. It's to the music of uh, the magic flute. 
and uh, and raises this issue of of the uh, he uses uh, images that were collected by uh, Germany itself uh, and uses these archival images to re-raise uh, the question of, of this early genocide. And you can see these images, decapitated heads. Um, and uh, and um, it's known as, the, as uh, going by this first uh, term, uh, genocide, Raphael Lemkin, the survivor of the Holocaust who coined the term genocide. So it wasn't used at the Nuremberg Charter. It's used later once there's a convention of genes uh, on the definition of gen genocide that's accepted in the UN. Raphael Lemkin, who was a survivor of his town and his, uh, uh, the only survivor of his town, uh, uses goes back to the Namibia and to the this first uh, genocide and defines it as uh, Germany's uh, genocide. One can never forget the language of Hitler, who talked about the Armenian genocide and said, "Who remembers the Armenian genocide now?" So for a very long time, um, uh, the Herero were forgotten and it was kind of eclipsed by the Holocaust. Uh, and, uh, and here Namibia uh, is now in negotiations, again, state to state, that is what Germany seeks, not to the peoples and not to the persons, but state to state, it's giving development aid to Namibia. So far, uh, to my understanding, the offers of reparation have been rejected because the Namibians want a recognition uh, that uh, this was genocide, uh, and they also would want an apology. So I think I'm over time, and I'm going to uh, end there. Uh, the you know the there are really uh, the conclusions are you know these themes continue uh, today, and I'm sure there'll be uh, overlap and affinities with some of the other uh, speakers. Uh, thanks, and ho hopefully we can address more of this in questions Q and A. Thank you so much, uh, Ruti. Uh, that, that was a, a wonderful recap of uh, a very complex uh, and um, actually a long uh, period. Um, and our next speaker is uh, Rebecca Berling, uh, it, who is an Emerita Professor of History at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. She's the author of A Question of Priorities, Democratic Reform and Economic Recovery in Postwar Germany and numerous articles on Germany under US occupation. And she's also the co-author co of The Life and Loss uh, in the Shadow of the Holocaust. From 2013 uh, till 15, she directed the International uh, Tracing Service in Germany, uh, co-editing multiple volumes of its yearbook. She was a 2016 fellow at the American Academy in Berlin, working on denazification. Currently, she directs the National Institute of Holocaust Documentation at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Rebecca? Okay. Thank you. Um, first of all, a quick disclaimer. Um, my views do not necessarily represent my employer, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, I've entitled this, um, maybe we could have slide one. I've entitled this Transitional Justice and Restitution in post war War II Western Germany. I come to this topic of restitution from the angle of conceptualizing Western allied approaches to denazification as transitional justice, positing the process as a reckoning with the recent past in pursuit of truth and justice as a prerequisite to reconciliation and ultimately democratization. The term denazification originated with a political advisor to General Eisenhower in April 1945, who conceived of the term as a parallel to demilitarization. PowerPoint two, please, uh, slide two. Nine different categories of the task were included under this rubric. Dissolution of the NSDAP, eradication of Nazism from German laws and regulations, elimination of Nazi symbols, street names and monuments, confiscation of property and records of the NSDAP, ban on all privileges emanating from Nazi rule, internment of Nazi elites, exclusion of all Nazis above the level of nominal party membership from public positions, suppression of Nazi indoctrination in every form and prohibition of parades and Nazi demonstrations. 
All of these sometimes described as based on an outlaw theory of Nazism, removing the Nazi outlaws from influence and thus undoing the effects associated with Nazi rule. But in most cases of restitution or transitional justice, we think of one part of society holding another accountable and restoring rights to those persecuted and disadvantaged by the ruling regime. With the total military occupation, like was the case in post-World War II Germany, it was outside conquering powers that were trying to prevent a resurgence of a regime deemed dangerous. The focus of the Western allies was not on restitution or transitional justice, but first and foremost on maintaining the defeat of the Nazis and restoring order. Increasing tensions of the Cold War and anti-communism in the West led the concerns of the US and its allies to shift more and more to the prevention of communist expansion in Europe rather than anti-Nazism. So the Western allies were less concerned with bringing justice to the victims than holding certain war criminals deemed to have committed crimes against humanity accountable and preventing other Nazi supporters from doing harm. The denazification tribunals, first run by the Allies, then by Germans under Allied oversight, dealt with former Nazis below the level of incrimination of war criminals as civil and not criminal proceedings. At least in the US zone of occupation, all former Nazis above the level of nominal party membership were to be vetted prior to being allowed in any position of influence. But could internment and exclusion provide justice and accountability, either from the view of the Germans themselves or those whose German citizenship had been stolen and denied by the Nazis, or the many more numerous victims outside the original boundaries of 1933 Germany? There were certainly Germans both before and during the war who did not go along with the Nazis, even actively resisted, but they were rarely honored by the Western allies or post-war Western German local or state officials, let alone by the Federal Republic as of 1949. Those Germans least complicit with the Nazi regime usually had the most interest in denazification as transitional justice. Anti-Nazi Germans and German emigres also imagined a purge of Nazis at the end of the war and a changing of the guard. Many such opponents of Nazism imagined a fundamental transformation of the German social economic relations, which they saw as tied to the political order that had allowed Nazism to triumph. Such post-war Germans were often treated with neglect or even abuse at the time in the Western zones as an annoying reminder that it was possible to not just go along, even to be anti-Nazi, even if one might risk being denounced and then more terrible consequences. Such Germans deserved an accounting and credit for what they had risked, but few truly got it in their lifetimes. And few, just like Jewish and Sinti and Roma victims in Germany and others throughout Europe, were ever able to face their victimizers in a safe space in which there might be truth and justice, if not reconciliation. Next, power, uh, next slide, please. The example of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission experience has shown the value of creating safe spaces, both for disclosure and a public accounting, where all witnesses have equal protection. Yet the critique after these procedures were held was that although the silence was broken with this process, once the story, however partial was told and heard, it was often forgotten. The question remains whether this breaking of the silence succeeded in overcoming anger, sorrow, and injury sufficiently for the transition to a reconciled way of life. But the truth and reconciliation process provides a sufficient personal and communal level of breaking the silence to lead to memorializing the victims and the experience. That's the question. If we use the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission model to think backwards about the German case, this is something historians usually don't do, thinking backwards, it becomes painfully clear that denazification did not constitute either a personal or communal level of breaking the silence. 
Only in the 1960s in trials such as that of Eichmann in Jerusalem or the Auschwitz trials in Frankfurt where victims appeared as witnesses, was there anything resembling tribunals where victims faced their victimizers? But even in these cases, it was often more about retribution than reparations or reconciliation. And it is certainly debatable whether such trials led many post-war Germans to confront their past. One need only think about the ways Billy Brandt, as mentioned by Ruti before, was branded as a traitor for escaping Germany as a member of the socialist resistance, let alone how he was criticized as chancellor for kneeling down at the site of the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial as a symbolic act of German atonement in 1970. Uh, next slide, please. However, gradually over the course of two generations, what was known in German either as Wiedergutmachung or Entschädigung did occur. Both of these terms are of course problematic, um, literally the process of making good again for Wiedergutmachung and many challenges whether or not that's possible. And Entschädigung, literally the process of undoing damage or recovering damages. This attempt, not at repair, developed from narrow monetary reparations into broader restitution programs, extending beyond Jewish victims and into a more programmatic examination of the history and legacy of the Third Reich, which on some levels did create more space for the development of accountability on a national level and responsibility for the memorialization of the victims. It's in my next section that I want to explore how and why this happened and its relevance for the contemporary United States. Next slide, please. Germany has only one state level formal reparations agreement. A 1951 Israeli diplomatic note to allied governments demanded compensation from Germany, even while acknowledging as the note read, quote, there can be no atonement or material compensation for a crime of such immense and horrifying magnitude, end of quote. For Jewish victims, reparations were intended to serve a restorative function, not a making good or undoing an injury. Under intense allied pressure, West German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer committed to paying a quote, moral and material indemnity for the unspeakable crimes committed in the name of the German people, end of quote, during World War II. The following year, 1952, the West German government signed a set of reparation agreements with Israel and an umbrella group of advocates known as the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany or the Jewish Claims Conference. Through successive reparation agreements that were negotiated with the Jewish Claims Conference, various groups of Jewish survivors ever increasing due to their age and health, all over the world have, however, received assistance. While Germany's reparations program may have been motivated on some level by morality, it was also pragmatic. West Germany was under intense pressure from Western allied governments to pay reparations. And West Germany wanted to be accepted as a partner to the West and to be admitted into the new Atlantic Pact although without German popular support for rearmament. This is of course another topic altogether, but I just want to mention it. Under the 1953 London Debt Agreement on Germany's pre-war and wartime debts, the Western Allies agrees that the issue of further reparations would be shelved until there was a formal peace treaty between Germany and victim countries and claimants. The September 1992 plus four agreement between the two Germanys and the four wartime allies, which sealed unification, was technically not a peace treaty, rendering reparations legally and politically settled and a non-issue, at least from the German perspective. This is the basis of the German refusal to engage in ne negotiations with other countries, such as Greece or Poland on state reparations. Uh, next slide, please. In his influential June 2014 Atlantic cover story, The Case for Reparations, Tanahisi Coates described the opposition to being compelled to pay reparations among Adenauer's own CDU in particular, and to the opposition to receiving it on the part of many Israelis. 
But he concludes this part of his powerful argument for the US to pay reparations to African-Americans for slavery by concluding reparations could not make up for the murder perpetrated by the Nazis. But they did launch Germany's reckoning with itself. I am not sure I agree with whether this reckoning was launched then, but it was a first step in monetary compensation. Discussions about restitution in the US today also circle around the issue of how long ago slavery was versus what the legacy is and on whose slave labor and inequality and injustice this country was built and continues. And here a German term, next slide please. Vergangenheitsbewältigung, or coming to terms with confronting the past, first used by Theodor Adorno, might help us analyze this better. The German language book, The Duden, defines it as, quote, public debate within a country on a problem and or a period of its recent history. While wissen.de, or literally knowledge.de, defines it as in present and future implicated past, raising sensitive questions of collective culpability. I don't think that many West Germans in the 1950s had begun there, as Coates would put it, reckoning with the past. I would argue that it took at least a generation for this to happen. As an undergrad in Munich in the 1970s, my German culture courses focused on these Vergangenheitsbewältigung discussions between the younger and older generations. The so-called questions posed by the generation of the 1968ers to their parents about what they had done or not done during the war. I was fascinated by this, and even then the however misguided domestic terrorist movement that was spawned by this lack of a thorough grappling with the past, the RAF. It wasn't until 1985, on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of Germany's surrender, that a West German leader could dare to call on a nation still divided at that time, made up of citizens who mostly didn't directly participate in the crime, to apologize and pay for it. Then West German president, Richard von Weizsäcker, the son of a diplomat during the Third Reich, tried at Nuremberg, made the case for intergenerational responsibility and solidarity in a powerful speech. Quote, the vast majority of today's population were either children then or had not been born, but their forefathers had left them a grave legacy. All of us, whether guilty or not, whether old or young, must accept the past. We are all affected by its consequences and liable for it. It was a daring move, but one in which Weizsäcker's moral authority was generally accepted. This, in my view, signaled a reckoning was beginning. Then German unification occurred and West German attention was absorbed with the evils of the Stasi and a decided preference to work on a reckoning there in this more recent past, next slide please, and over there in Austin. Then in 2000, the foundation Remembrance, Responsibility and Future, or the AFLZ, was established and supported by all the parties in the then Bundestag, to provide individual humanitarian payments to be made to former slave and forced laborers and other victims of national socialism on behalf of the state and private enterprises that had benefited from the forced and slave labor of individuals held against their will in ghettos and camps, compelled to work for the benefit of the Nazi regime and its allies. In his concluding report on the six-year payments program, then German President Horst Köhler declared that the activities of the foundation had, quote, helped to promote public recognition that this wrongdoing was indeed criminal and that responsibility for it needed to be expressed in tangibly financial terms. Financial terms are not the same as the TRC ideal of breaking the silence on either a personal or communal level. And yet I would argue they did allow a new generation of Germans, more detached on many levels, without direct culpability to re-examine the past. The new public governmental and private corporate level of cooperation on which this funding was based, set the stage for more public and national acceptance 
of the need for memorialization. The fact that German taxpayers did not shoulder this responsibility alone may well have enhanced the likelihood of overall public acceptance. The efforts of the last 20 years to reach a broader swath of victims has to be understood in the context of generational distance. The fact that those Germans deciding on compensation were the children or increasingly the grandchildren of those Nazis or bystanders. These sums were paid bureaucratically and via institutions and not in settings where perpetrators or even bystanders or opportunists were called to account for their misdeeds or to face those who suffered due to their actions or inactions. Next slide, please. So no personalized truth and reconciliation took place. This was partly because of how late this was happening, who now sat in parliament or on the boards of industry and commerce, the children and grandchildren of the Teta, the doers. There are those who think the Germans represent a model for restitution that the US might emulate. It was true that foundations like the Eiffel set have gone on beyond monetary compensation to groups and individuals to use their funds to sponsor programs that expose the history of not only the Third Reich, but the legacy of the Third Reich for the children and grandchildren of the Tata and victims and bystanders. But time alone does not heal. It can simply create thin-skinned scabs over wounds and generations of oppression and inherited disadvantages. The successes of the AfD in Germany and the preference to marginalize or silence rather than confront and bring out into the open should be the lesson we learn. We only need to think about the killings of migrants and asylum seekers over the last decades, and not just by Germans of East German descent, to recognize that silencing does not deal with the problem. Eventually, a younger, German, a younger generation of Germans refused to keep silent and enjoyed the mercy of having been born late. Helmut Kohl's um, expression of Gnade der Spätgeborene, questioning instead whether their parents' desire to put this behind them serves anyone well. At least in large parts of Germany, there are significant numbers of Germans now recognized as a much more multiracial and multi-ethnic group of various generations who know what happened who ask questions about the legacy and about what their grandparents did or did not do, who continue to rename streets as citizens initiatives and unbury the past of their neighborhoods and question the basis of their own well-being. As a country, we in the United States are clearly not yet there. I want to leave you with an image from one of the many Black Lives Matter demonstrations last June 6th this one in Munich, the so-called capital of the, Munich, of the Nazi movement. Thank you. The fact that the Black Lives Matter march in Munich converged on the Königsplatz is very symbolic. The Königsplatz is known for its monumental architecture and it was used during the Third Reich as a square for the Nazi party's mass rallies. The Brown House or Braunes House, the national headquarters for the Nazi party in Germany was located just off the square. Two so-called honor temples or Ehrentempel were erected at the east side of the Königsplatz to enshrine the remains of the 16 Nazis killed in the 1923 Beer Hall Putsch. So-called martyrs who were thereafter worshiped by the Nazis. Both temples were demolished by the US Army in 1947, although their platforms remain to this day. You sort of see them on the side in this image. This was of course in Munich, also the site of the Nazi book burnings in 1933. The reclaiming of the space in this way by these 25,000 people in Munich is of course a form of confronting the past and using it to honor the deaths of the many innocent black lives in this country. I don't know if you can tell from reading the signs um, from your image, but there's one that says silence is violence. And of course, I was reminded very much by the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commissions in South Africa with the signage. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you so much, uh, Rebecca, for um, your both informative and uh, moving uh, presentation, uh, and also for uh, bringing the topic uh, to US uh, reparations. Uh, let's move to our third uh, speaker, uh, Nick Mulder, um, who is an assistant professor of uh, modern European history at Cornell University. He works on political and economic history with a particular focus on the interwar period. His book, The Economic Weapon, The Rise of Sanctions as a Tool of Modern War, is forthcoming with Yale University Press. And he's working on a new project on the history of confiscation in the mid 20th century. Nick, it's, the screen is yours. Yeah, th <clears throat> thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to thank Ezra Akchan and everyone else at the Institute for European Studies who put on this event and my fellow panelists also for those uh, presentations that we already had and, and the one uh, yet to come. Um, so I want to take a few moments um, today to talk about what I think is an interesting and important red thread throughout the uh, historical debates about reparations in Germany. And that's the problem and the role of property and how to deal with it and uh, the question of expropriation. And this comes up in one way or another in many debates about reparations. But I think that uh, because there are different cases with specific contexts, we oftentimes find it quite difficult to come up with a coherent account of how uh, property functions. And um, recently, I think there have been a number of interesting events that have brought together the theme of property and uh, who has access to it, uh, who has claims to it with the uh, recurring debates about reparations and restitution in German history. So um, I'm very grateful to Ruti Teitel for uh, giving such a good overview of the uh, different historical phases. I just want to uh, begin with three snapshots, really. There, This is not an exhaustive overview, but three snapshots of this debate about reparations. Um, as she already mentioned, uh, I think beginning with the reparations after World War I and the Paris peace treaties. Now, I think that that lives on in popular memory, oftentimes as a quite onerous peace treaty on Germany. And here you see a cartoon in which Germany is portrayed as a, as a horse lifted off its feet by the weight of an unlimited indemnity. Um, I think it's in recent years now, historians have uh, tended to emphasize how, uh, in fact, there were lots of things about the Versailles Treaty that made it more flexible than uh, at the time many people made it out to be, that the size of the reparation being unlimited was actually an advantage because it allowed for negotiation and for flexible treatment. And uh, that in that sense, maybe the Versailles Treaty, uh, the reparations part of it at least, was less of a problem for Germany than many people think. But there were certainly things that I'll go into in a moment about it that I think were very um, misunderstood uh, and did cause problems later on. Um, then the, the already mentioned moment in uh, the early 1950s of the West German-Israeli reparations agreement, really important uh, as the other two presentations also mentioned for the important uh, pioneering role really in getting going a conversation about uh, national responsibility for the Holocaust. Of course, Holocaust memory and Holocaust consciousness in Germany and in the West uh, is a much later thing. It definitely didn't really develop in the early 1950s, but the uh, moral beginnings of it in this state-to-state -state agreement, I think, are very significant. And all the way until today, the ongoing cases, uh, but also its later extension in the 90s to corporate responsibility, um, I think are an important moment. And uh, in recent uh, years, um, these debates that we've been seeing about Germany's colonial legacy, uh, the imperial German colonial empire of the late 19th and early 20th century, and particularly the genocides that happened uh, in uh, German Southwest Africa, now Namibia. And uh, as far as I can tell, indeed, now the, the talks between Germany and Namibia about this have kind of bogged down over issues of recognition and what sort of material resource transfer, if any, could be sufficient. But it's interesting to note that in 2019, for example, Germany did begin uh, not just with um, some monetary payments, but uh, particularly beginning by uh, re restoring objects that uh, it had taken in the 19th century from Namibia. And this was one interesting uh, case of a, a stone cross that had been planted in the late 15th century by Portuguese explorers on the Namibian coast. 
And I think it actually represents quite well one of the problems with these restitution and reparations debates, which, which is that oftentimes at a material level, it's only possible to talk about what might be exchanged when there is a concrete sort of property claim or an object that under Western legal systems can be thought of and counted as property. And these more intangible aspects of restitution and reparations are very difficult to grapple with. But at the same time, uh, this history, I think now being uh, fairly well understood, at these same moments, we have debates going on within Germany, but in the world as a whole, about what the nature of property and the role of property in the social order at the same time is. And that I think is oftentimes missed. In the uh, era of the Versailles Treaty and the Paris Peace Treaties, for example, uh, Germany was not the only country that lost property and that saw expropriation at the hands of the allies. Uh, this went quite far actually, so German citizens who had property in other countries uh, around the world oftentimes were likely to see that seized or sequestered during the war. And then this was oftentimes taken away from them and counted towards the reparations burden that Germany had to pay eventually. And that um, expropriation that happened during the war already was very significant. It uh, amounted to about half of the total uh, lump sum that Germany over time ended up paying in reparations. But that happened in very small annual payments. This expropriation of foreign property happened in one fell swoop. Um, at the same time, it, within Germany also, the move from uh, the imperial order to a new democratic republic and the revolution that produced the Weimar Republic also saw a new attitude towards property and towards expropriation. And this uh, took, uh, in one case, the form of the expropriation of the German aristocracy, a part of it under the German Empire, uh, the so-called Fürsten and Eignung, uh, or expropriation of princes. And here you see a poster at the bottom left uh, of a campaign at, the mo at that time being held by the German Social Democrats for the expropriation of the princes without any compensation. This was the crucial part. Uh, they, uh, it was argued, were inheritors of essentially feudal sovereign uh, jurisdictions, and they didn't have any right under civil law to have landed property in large amounts the same way that bourgeois citizens had. And uh, here it, it says basically not a penny to the princes, they have enough. Uh, instead, we should save the German people the burden of having to pay money to this aristocracy that it is already relegated to constitutional insignificance uh, in the Weimar Republic. This was an extremely fraught issue actually in the 1920s, um, I think often ignored in the Weimar Republic as a source of considerable tension between the left and the right and ultimately uh, the forces of the right that ended up overthrowing the Weimar Republic used arguments that these expropriation provisions were putting at risk the stability of the social order as a whole. In 1926, there was a popular referendum about this, and uh, this led to a particularly intense debate. Uh, but since then, it, it, it basically was always used uh, by opponents of the Weimar Republic as an example of a kind of dangerous slippery slope towards tyranny if expropriation was allowed to go too far. In the middle of the 20th century, of course, the division of Germany and the uh, arrival into power of communism, the communist takeover in East Germany, led again to a wave of expropriations. Uh, this is a poster uh, about noble land belonging in the farmer's hand, uh, which was the slogan used for the agrarian reform that expropriated the big landowners in East Germany, the Junkers. And uh, at the same time, though, this wasn't limited to East Germany. West Germany also engaged in expropriations. Many major industrial enterprises that had been either owned by the Nazi states or that had owners that had been compromised by their uh, complicity in Nazi crimes uh, were liable to be expropriated. And this went on at the same time as these reparations agreements uh, with Israel, but also the reparations that Germany agreed to pay under the Potsdam Agreement to the Soviet Union for the aggression uh, of uh, invading in 1941. And interestingly, some of these factories, uh, for example, the Volkswagen factory in Germany, were actually scheduled to be transferred in their entirety as industrial reparations to the Soviet Union. It's a very interesting thing that I think today is kind of uh, forgotten that uh, at the time it was considered possible to move uh, industry and actually move concrete um, means of production as a form of reparations to other countries. Um, 
And in the, the current moment now about uh, Germany's post-colonial responsibilities for, for colonial crimes, um, again, actually, we've seen a really interesting uh, coming together of different uh, discussions about property and expropriation in Germany itself. Most importantly, and I think what's been in the news quite a lot is now the recent big case of the Hohenzollern dynasty, uh, the inheritors of, oh, sorry, descendants of the, the German princely uh, dynasty that, that ruled the empire uh, before 1918 to uh, have restitution for the losses that they suffered in 1945 when the communists uh, expropriated a large part of their East German property. And um, this, I think, all shows how uh, these debates about re reparations and debates about property and expropriation intertwine and intersect at every moment. But oftentimes, um, as uh, Ruti Teitel mentioned in her uh, um, presentation, the very state-centered uh, nature of debates about reparations misses that there's a lot going on within the state, within the constitutional order about property. And um, when we start from this recognition that reparations debates basically always involve uh, questions of re the redistribution of resources and thereby of property rights, I think we can also start to think a little bit more about the uh, difficulties of coming up with one size fits all formulas, right? That's really one of the, the, the I think, tendencies to be avoided. And yet when we talk about property, many people do have a pretty, I think, coherent and uh, straightforward account of how property functions, but historically that's changed quite a lot and we have to resort, I think, to very different understandings in different cases. Um, the main paradox, if we put all of those uh, moments that I just mentioned side by side, is that we can see that at some moments, expropriation is the injustice being uh, perpetrated. The really big example of this, of course, is the Aryanization of Jewish property by the Nazi regime. This was itself part of a campaign of persecution um, it um, was extremely, extremely uh, coercive and violent. And uh, it's also an important case, I think, and a reason why in Germany expropriation has always been tainted as a result by the memory of the Third Reich itself. But interestingly, the response to Nazism and the response also to German war guilt and to these other cases has been actually to use expropriation as a form of compensation. And that already began in the reaction to the Nazi experience itself in East Germany, particularly under communism, uh, the expropriation of industrial property in 1946 was actually framed as an expropriation of war criminals. So expropriation itself was now the way that uh, the injustice of Nazism and war crimes itself could at least partially be uh, resolved. Um, of course, what you see in both of these cases, uh, in the Nazi case and in, in the East German case, is that the state here effectively takes it upon itself to define what counts as, as a legal claims of property and legitimate property and what does not. And this then, I think, is the, the kind of polemical elements that often resurfaces in these discussions that makes it quite difficult, I think, to get a grip on this, um, that there's a big political theory debate really going on underneath this. And uh, that's throughout the 20th century really taken a form, broadly speaking, of a standoff between more statist and more individualist or more liberal understandings of property. Um, if you will, an arbitrary theory that says property is whatever the state says it is, it can revoke and reinstate people's rights at will, whether that is for the pursuit of a uh, greater Germany or to punish Nazism for its crimes. Uh, and on the other hand, a counter reaction against that, that's been particularly strong in uh, German liberalism and in, uh, uh, of course, the German legal tradition and its links with economic interests. Uh, and we recently come to understand that much better due to the interest in the history also of neoliberalism and its German variety, ordo liberalism. And what we now have a much better understanding of is that in the middle of the 20th century, a large part of the thinking about the relationship between the state and an individual in Germany was marked by this fear of collectivism, of the state overreaching, and that uh, neoliberalism and ordo liberalism were really attempts to kind of re-separate the realm of the state and the realm of property from each other. And interestingly, at the time when Adenauer was in fact um, admitting that Germany had a reparations responsibility towards Israel and the uh, Jewish survivors of the Holocaust, he was also engaged in crafting a new uh, international order in which in, uh, investors' property in other countries would be very strongly protected against expropriation. And the person at the center of that, you can see uh, right next to Adenauer on his right here, uh, between him and the Indian Prime Minister Nehru, 
Uh, it was a, na a man known as uh, Hermann Josef Abs. He was a leading banker in Deutsche Bank, and he was responsible for some of the first investor state dispute uh, settlement treaties in the late 1950s. And these really sought to protect corporate property in many places around the world and um, make a kind of realm for corporations in which the state could not touch any sort of property um, at all. So this is a very strong counter reaction against uh, the, the state role. And um, interestingly though, what we might think of West Germany in, in the late 40s and early 50s as being marked then by a kind of trauma and by a, a, an unconditional acceptance of the right to private property. But if we look at the German basic law that's still in operation today, the German constitution, it's Article 14 actually takes a very pragmatic and quite progressive view of property as something that can uh, and should be modified according to the public interest. So in Article 14 of the German constitution, uh, there's an explicit provision that property is not just about rights, but also entails obligations here in the second phrase. And I've um, made cursive uh, that it shall also serve the public good, dem wohle der Allgemeinheit. And uh, then in the final section, what I've italicized is that expropriation in, uh, under German law is permissible, but only for the public good. So again, there's a recognition of this, and this language is taken almost word for word from the Weimar Constitution, actually. And it's an interesting uh, sign that the reality of this polemical debate between statists and liberals actually hides uh, the considerable options for molding this in accordance with public interest. Uh, interestingly, that's recently become uh, much more visible uh, as well, and I'll come to that now at the end. Um, I think what we uh, need to really reckon with is that a lot of these debates are uh, overly polemical and, and based on quite reductionistic and binary understanding of how property works, and that when we want to have a, mo a more useful and productive view of property, in debates about restitution and reparation, we need to think of it not in terms of a dyad, but in terms of a triad. So the, the classic dyad, according to this polemical uh, tradition that I mentioned, would be that the state and individuals essentially fight over resources and that in the balance between them, some sort of recognition of property or property claims arises. Either the state manages to define what that is or the re individuals get recognition for those rights uh, and they get to preserve them at any cost unconditionally against the state always and everywhere. But actually in practice, um, as the German constitution prescribes and as I think uh, we should also uh, yeah, keep in mind in these discussions, there's a third actor here, which is the public good itself. Uh, and this allows us, I think, very usefully to turn this diet into a triad to see this as a much more multidimensional question, um, one in which we can also deflate some of the heat out of this discussion. When we are using expropriation as a device for reparations or restitution, we're not necessarily endangering individual liberty. We can actually, as collectivities, decide to do this uh, freely. Um, and with protection and recognition of individual rights. And interestingly, I think that's a very useful, this triadic framework is also very useful to understand recent discussions that have been going on in Germany where Article 14 has now all of a sudden come very much back into the center of public discussion, particularly around this discussion in Berlin where the city government has now instituted a, a big rent control law. But that began actually a few years ago with calls for outright expropriation of large landlords in order to bring living costs in Berlin down. And um, at the same time, I also think that the question of climate and climate reparations force us to think in terms of this third category, this third pole in the debate. We need to have a debate about what the public good in the age of climate change consists of and how we might modify both the power of the state and the nature of individual property rights in light of that. And then finally, that also, of course, really ties into the discussion about post-colonial reparations and uh, the reparations uh, discussions between Germany and Namibia. And here it's interesting to note that while Germany and Namibia are talking about recognition for the German uh, genocide against the uh, Herero and Nama in the early 20th century, within Namibia too, there are very important discussions about the nature of property because actually as a result of German colonialism, 70% of the farmland in Namibia now belongs largely to white farmers. Uh, this after um, German Southwest Africa um, was brought under League of Nations control, it came under the control of apartheid South Africa. 
and a, a very, very strongly unequal land owning uh, structure has persisted there. And actually the Namibian government is under some pressure from below by activist groups to grant more land to landless people in Namibia itself. So again, the issue of interstate reparations and that of the domestic property order um, are also at stake there. And uh, I don't think that this formula, this triadic uh, formula provides any clear cut necessarily standard answers, but I think it provides a much more constructive and fruitful way to think about who owes what to whom and how we might work uh, towards yeah, the restitution for past harms. Thanks very much. Um, thank you so much, Nick, for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation that raised the complexity of modern uh, property regimes in such a short time and also uh, showing so much, uh, what is at stake and uh, so many things are at stake at different uh, situations. And also thank you for gesturing toward the climate reparations for which we will have uh, a separate panel um, in, um, in April. Uh, so let's move on to our uh, final uh, speaker, Tiffany Florville, uh, who is an associate professor of 20th century European women's and gender history at the University of New Mexico. She specializes in the histories of post-1945 Europe, um, the African di diaspora, social movements, Black internationalism, as well as gender and sexuality. She has published piece pieces in the Journal of Civil and uh, Human Rights uh, and the German Quarterly. Floral has also credited the volume Rethinking Black German Studies, Approaches, Interventions, and Histories. She has also published uh, chapters in edited volumes. Her recent manuscript, Mobilizing Black Germany, Afro-German Woman and the Making of a Transnational Movement, uh, offers the first full-length study of the history of the Black German movement of the 1980s to the 2000s. She sits on the advisory board and editorial board for several organizations and journals, including the Black German Heritage and Research Association, and on the editorial board for Central European History, She's also an editor of the Imagining Black Europe book series. Many the screen is yours. Okay, thank you. I am the only one who doesn't have a PowerPoint slide. Um, and I should also preface that um, I've come down with a little cold and so I sound not my, my real, my, this is my voice for today. So I've entitled my talk, um, Black Germans Wake Work as Reparative Justice. And Christina Sharp's In the Wake on, Blake, on Blackness and Being, she writes, and I quote, if, as I've suggested so far, we think the metaphor of the wake and the entirety of its meanings, the keeping watch with the dead, the path of a ship, a consequence of something in the line of fight, flight, and or sight, awakening and consciousness, and we join wake work, wake with work in order that we might make the wake and wake work are analytic, we might continue to imagine new ways to live in the wake of slavery and slavery's afterlives to survive and more the afterlife of property. In short, I mean wake work to be a mode of inhabiting and rupturing the epistem with our known lived and unimaginable lives, end quote. Sharp's concept of wake work offers a theory and praxis of black being in the diaspora. Wake work serves as an act of resistance that recognizes the ongoing presence of slavery and colonialism in the present. Moreover, it requires one to be attentive to caring for the living and the dead, which privileges mourning at all levels, local, national, and global in the quotidian. But wake work also entails a consciousness and provides new forms of resistance that are tied to diasporic expressive practices and traditions. I begin, uh, excuse me, I began with a brief discussion of Sharp's critical concept of wake work because it's an important description of the work that black Germans pursued with their movement in the 1980s and to the present with post-colonial and anti-racist activism. With their wake work, black Germans became what I call quotidian intellectuals who offered new forms of black knowledge that enabled them to survive and resist their erasure negation and subjection in the German metropole and in its former colonies. Through the organization of anti-racist demonstrations, international conferences, 
consciousness raising workshops, cultural performances, and more. Black Germans embrace vernacular culture and aesthetics that privilege the everyday in content and form, opening up new modes of resistance. They also reclaim theirs and Black um, and others Black humanity and embrace new ideas that help them imagine a better world. While Sharp doesn't see wave work as a form of redress to the presence of an anti-Black racism that upholds, in this case, American democracy, I, I argue that Black German wake work has served as a corrective and a disturbance, particularly in a country that experiences what Ann Stoller refers to as colonial aphasia. For Stoller, colonial aphasia is Europeans' disassociation with their colonial paths, pasts, and as a result, these paths become unspeakable. Her concept also helps to supplant ideas of forgetting and amnesia. Indeed, Black Germans' wake work rectified the wrongs of the past and publicly called attention to the ongoing presence of German colonialism in the everyday and how colonialism has impacted many within and beyond Germany's Black diaspora. In fact, this colonialism dictated the parameters of German identity, citizenship, and belonging, normalizing whiteness and white supremacy in the process. And here I'm referring to the 1913 um, German citizenship law that was um, basically on the books until 1999-2000. In addition to the organizational events, such as that their annual Black History Month celebrations within the, within the larger modern Black German movement, Another prominent way that they've drawn attention to Germany's colonial past is advocating for reparations of Namibian bones from the Charité to be returned. Black German activists such as Tahir Della and Joseph Kwesi Atkins are involved with Berlin Postcolonial, a human rights organization that pushes for a critical confrontation with German colonialism. I use these brief examples of Black German wake work to show what shaped these grassroots postcolonial forms of reparation and restitution took when Black Germans made claims for justice and equality in the Federal Republic of Germany. Their wake work, <clears throat> excuse me, served didactic purposes, but it also had moral, cultural, and political implications. Now let's turn a little bit more to the Black German movement. The emergence of the modern Black German movement signaled the first community effort at pursuing wake work at both, uh, as both a theory and practice. The movement resulted in the establishment of two grassroots cultural political organizations, ISD or the Initiative of Black Germans. Now um, it's now it's referred to as um, the Initiative of Black People in Germany and ADEFRA Af or Afro-German Women, which is now referred to as um, Black German and Black German Women in Germany. ISD was created in 1985 and I, um, ADEFRA was created in 1986. ISD was co-founded by Maya Im, Katarina Guntoya, Abinata Mako, Mi Ari, and others. ADEFRA was a feminist organization pioneered by queer feminists, individuals, including individuals such as uh, Ogun, um, Katarina Guntoya, who I previously mentioned, Yasmin Edding, Judy Gummidge, and Eva von Perch. This moment signified a new stage in diasporic activism because Black German quotidian intellectuals decided to no longer live in silence and invisibility. Reclaiming their place within the nation, Black Germans created local ISD and ADEFRA chapters across West German cities, such as Berlin, Frankfurt, Frankfurt Dusseldorf and Munich, and in former East German cities, such as Leipzig and Dresden, especially after the fall of the wall. Black Germans push their intersectional concerns about oppression, racism, and white supremacy in Germany to the fore. These organizations represented Black German quotidian activism on the ground as they advocated and advanced cultural and political practices that certainly entailed the invention of new diasporic traditions in a white society that had long, both long othered and ignored them. Moreover, the establishment of the modern Black German movement was also due to the existence of overlapping diasporic resources, which included diverse peoples, ideas, and symbols present in Germany. These individuals came from across the Black diaspora. The 1980s brought writers, performers, and filmmakers to Germany. And a large number of these Black diasporic people were especially from the continent of Africa. They wrote, lived, worked, and survived in Berlin. 
Black Germans connected and collaborated with them. Some of those individuals include South African writer and artist um, Vishu Michu and Somalian writer Omar Chabelle. Berlin was an important major city that served as a site for global intersections. So let's turn now to the Black, inter, the sort of Black History Month events that I mentioned as a type of wake work. Black Germans relied on diasporic resources from the United States to create their annual Black History Month events in Berlin. Black Germans Danny Hapka, Roy Weichert, and Michael Reichel, along with African-American Patricia Eilach, organized the first one in February of 1990. But the idea for the Black History Month originated in 1989. These, these individuals were members and often co-founders of ISD Berlin, and they coordinated with local diasporic and migrant organizations. In the United States, it was the father of Black History Month, African-American historian Carter G. Woodson, who started Negro History Week in 1926, illustrating Black Germans' conscious ability to foster transnational linkages with their diasporic kin in the United States. But their efforts must also be understood as a response to the rising tide of xenophobia and racism in both Germanys before and after the fall of the wall and the need to emphasize the existence of people of African descent in Germany. One of the main goals of the BHMs was to challenge Germany's ignorance about racism and unearth and share different diasporic histories, a point often expressed in the BHM programs. The 1991, for example, noted that there were, and I quote, there were limited opportunities to learn about black history in Germany but pre prejudices against Black people's culture and history were widespread, end quote. In a 1996 uh, program, Black History Month Committee stress, the specific situation of Black people forms the background of the Black History Month. In fact, the need for this kind of form in Germany cannot be overemphasized, considering the fact that limited opportunities are accorded objective information about the present and past of Black people. While on the contrary, much more disinformation is presented regarding prejudiced opinions against them and their cultures." End quote. This emphasis remained pronounced in all of the BHMs. Nearly all of the sessions at the first Black History Month events focused on Black diasporic themes, including panels that are, were entitled, The Cultural Riches in Africa, The History of Slavery, The Life and Work of Malcolm X, and The Civil Rights Movement in the US and Martin Luther King Jr. Other ISD and ADEFRA chapters arranged a program that included screenings of 14 South African films, multiple seminars on racism, colonialism, resistance movements, and more. And here I should note that there is a wide variety of um, events, um, historical workshops, sociological workshops, conferences, film screenings, art exhibitions. So the, so the list goes on and with these sort of Black History Month events were able to um, deliver. Black history, um, Black Germans, excuse me, continued this internationalist approach with subsequent Black History Months, including their last one in 2000. And now I should note also that um, in 2009, Black History Month has be um, began again. So it's now still a sort of a vibrant space. ISD's Black History Months also facilitated the academic study of Black history, furthering the field of Black German studies along with supporting public outreach for this notion of the public good that previous, uh, um, my previous panels have talked about. These acts not only represented Black German wake work in practice, but also uncovered a tradition of ra a Black radicalism found, that found expression on German soil. At the BHM celebrations in Berlin, Black Germans wake work centered intellectualism in the everyday. They creatively tackled the themes of colonialism, its afterlives, Black European history, and more. These annual BHM events were acts of recovery that rendered Blackness legible and acknowledged how the past informed the present. At both the 1990 and 1991 BHMs, for instance, ISD co-founder and member John Kantara presented a panel entitled Afro-German History, 
In it, he tried to overturn the common view that Black German history began in 1945 by demonstrating that Black Germans were located in Germany since the 18th century. And certainly others have pushed this chronology back to the 13th century. Discussing these narratives, Kantara's seminar detailed Black German lives under National Socialism and underscore that Germany was and has always been a multicultural and multiracial society. At his 1990 presentation, he offered details about Anton William Amel, an African Enlightenment philosopher who studied and taught in 18th century Halle and Jena. Just last year, Emstrasse was changed to Anton William Amelstrasse due in part to Black German activism. With his panels, Kantara gave Black Germans a better self-image and other points of reference through which to understand their identity in German society. Indeed, this was important wake work that recognized the dead and no longer allowed people of African descent to be redacted and violently displaced from, German, from the German nation. But these events also reflect an ethics of care about their brothers and sisters in the larger black diaspora. Black German quotidian intellectuals, expression of ethics of care served as forms of advocacy and accountability. They pushed for white Germans to offer historical amends due to colonial atrocities inflicted on Africans from German Southwest Africa, which basically is modern day Namibia and German um, um, East Africa, which includes Burundi, Rwanda, and Tanzania. Beginning in 1884 with Chancellor Otto von Bismarck's Congo Conference or the Berlin Congress um, to 1919 to the signing of the Versailles Treaty and the loss of those colonies. The German empire used uh, colonial administrators and scientists to collect human skulls and fossils. During the Namia and Hararo genocide, which took place from 1904 to 1908, colonial forces sent more than 3,000 Nabi and Hararo skulls back to Germany for study at universities and institutions, including the Charité. These skulls and bones were on, also displayed in museums or ended up in private collections across the nation. In the Wilhelmine period, Germans utilized those bones to support their racist claims of black inferiority. And of course, to also advance white supremacy. And oftentimes uh, there's a reluctance to really sort of talk about white supremacy in the German context, but scholars such as Maisha um, Uma have referred to um, whiteness in the German context as a super, uh, as a super whiteness. And in this way, we we see how objective racial science was never value free. And I wanna also mention that, you know, Eugene Fisher, you know, uh, studied um, um, in Namibia and he's also very key in terms of thinking about the application of Nazi ideology. Uh, and so he was also used to, um, to help with the sterilization of um, the Rhineland bastards. Um, those were actually sort of black German children who were the offspring of French colonial soldiers and white German women in, um, in the interwar period. So after, um, after World War I. And so he's actually, there's a direct, a direct linkage from Eugene Fisher in the colonial setting to um, the Nazi regime. So that, that, that ideology, that racial ideology. So efforts to return Namibian bones with the late, um, with the last operation ceremony taking place in August of 2018, as well as the emphasis on Germany's colonial legacy constitute wake work that radically reimagines Africa and Germany, oftentimes flipping the script of who is primitive and who is civilized. This wake work offers restitution in a variety of forms that center the dead and care for the living. Black German activists such as Atkins and Della recognize that Germany's current attitudes, institutions, and structures were built on a legacy of racism shaped by that colonial period. And they see continuities from the colonial period to national socialism and the modern times. And here I'm also talking about the rise of Alternative for Deutschland and sort of how that linkage of um, Islamophobia is also linked back to notions of the other. Working with Berlin post-colonial, they organized walking tours and events around Berlin that draw attention to Germany's colonial legacy in the quotidian. In addition, Tanzanian activists 
uh, Mityaka Sururu Mubura, a co-founder of, uh, of Berlin Postcolonial, continues to put, push for restitution of human remains that were stolen during the colonial period. He's been a key figure in the reparation of Namibian bones. He's also been pushing for the bones of um, Tanzanians from the Maji Maji um, revolt that took place as well in the early 20th century Germany, <clears throat> excuse me. He's also joined with others to demand the renaming of colonists and racist street names. This is not to suggest, of course, that Namibians themselves have not pursued wake work either, as Nick has also um, discussed. They've also sued the German government and advocated for their dead, but they still await an appropriate and official apology for the genocide. So to conclude, so why does this matter? And how does this relate to the larger themes of the Institute for European Studies, repair and reparations? I use these examples to demonstrate how wake work has been integral to the work that black Germans and others in Germany's black diaspora have pursued for years. This work is a corrective and not necessarily a panacea, but it also disrupts the status quo and challenges white Germans to interrogate their complicity interlocking systems of oppression. Black German quotidian intellectuals have sought to remedy centuries of entrenched German discourses, practices and symbols that produce and reproduce black subjects negation. Both the BHMs and the work of Berlin Postcolonial show us the contours of wake work as a form of reparative justice. Together, Black Germans dare to claim or make spaces of something like freedom that reimagine and transform spaces for and practices of an ethics of care, as in repair, maintenance, and attention, an ethics of seeing and of being in the wake of consciousness. In this way, their wake work is transformative and gives us examples of a new world filled with manifold possibilities in the present and in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tiffany. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion now. Um, so, um, just a reminder of something that I said uh, in the introduction uh, for our attendees, uh, please um, do uh, write your questions in the Q&A box uh, that uh, you can find at the bottom of uh, your screen. Um, so for um, the, maybe while we are, there are a few questions uh, already, but uh, maybe while we're waiting for others to um, write their questions, I would like to ask uh, the uh, panelists if they have comments on each other's um, talks. Uh, and something that uh, strikes me really, I mean, there's so many um, things to be discussed by um, when these uh, four talks are put in dialogue, but something that immediately striked me is um, what might be called an inverted procedure or inverted chronology in, in material and moral uh, reparations when it comes to post-Nazi and post-colonial reparations. For instance, Rebecca, uh, you talked about how the financial reparations uh, almost forced by the Allies came first and the reckoning moral reparations, like, let's call it, came uh, much later. Um, whereas uh, Tiffany, um, I mean, what your uh, presentation in a way uh, shows is that it's perhaps the opposite that's happening today, reckoning with this past on the streets by the intellectuals, by the black history and month and so on is coming first, but the material reparations, financial reparations are pending. So um, that's um, something that struck me when the two um, talks um, um, were uh, happening back back, but obviously there's so many other uh, questions that I have. So uh, I would like to open the floor to the speakers to see if they have any comments uh, on each other or on this um, moral uh, versus material reparations and how the chronology might be inverted. Um, Re Rebecca, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> First of all, this was this was a great panel. Thank you so much for putting this together. I, I neglected to say thanks. I was so anxious to get started. Um, but um, it's it's interesting. I was thinking about the role of the state, and of course, the role of the state is tends to be more financial than moral. Um, 
And I think that plays a role, whether you're working at the quotidian level for such a wonderful world, word and, and sort of on the street um, and starting from, from, from below. Um, I, I did want to um, come back to something that Nick said that, that reminded me of a, of a great example of, of the role of property in all of this. Um, in Munich, um, in the occupation period, um, there was an attempt to prevent um, so-called SS neighborhood settlements. So, so developments that had been created um, for the SS and their families um, and paid for, of course, um, by um, the, the local um, Nazi municipalities, Nazi controlled municipalities. And there was an attempt in terms of thinking about denazification and undoing Nazi advantages, whether or not um, these settlements could be taken away um, from SS families. Um, and the local um, SPD, Social Democratic Party and the city council really felt that it should happen and that housing should also be denazified. And yet ultimately the Bavarian state came in and, and said property rights can't be placed into question. They were legally acquired. And, and despite the fact that this was an advantage acquired through um, connections with the Nazi state that you could not simply take it away. So it's, it's very interesting because of course there were all sorts of attempts on that sort of quotidian level in the immediate aftermath of the war by these so-called Antifa groups, not quite the same as today, um, that were trying to compel former Nazis to be the ones out cleaning the rubble to do manual labor, et cetera. And then often the um, intervention of allies and of course the first restored municipal governments that this was not orderly, this was not according to traditional um, punitive measures, et cetera. So I just wanted to bring that up because I, I think that whole question of where do property rights fit into this um, is such an interesting one. Uh, Nick, uh, I do. Yeah, yeah but, um, very. Uh, thank you. Um, no, I'm glad. Uh, that, uh, for, thank you for that example, Rebecca. Um, and I think that that's one of the interesting issues uh, that I came across when kind of putting all of this in a row, essentially about this history. Uh, that we tend to, I think, think about the creation of the Federal Republic in the late '40s as a moment where. Uh, anti-communism oftentimes took precedence over a reckoning with the Nazi past, right? Many people were able to get off relatively scot-free also as a result of that. But uh, when you look at the at what, what was actually written into, into the constitution, I think a, an interesting part of the progressive Weimar legacy was actually preserved in, that, um, in the constitution. Uh, also to the great, uh, I think, uh, uh, disquiet uh, recently of people in the FAZ who discovered that this was actually possible uh, in relation to the German rent, uh, the Berlin rent um, discussion, uh, that the German constitution does allow for this. Um, and I think that maybe that leads us to have a slightly more positive view of the late 40s, at least than I had before I started looking into this uh, period when I had always associated that with, yeah, exactly, the uh, uh, unconditional defense, basically, of property, which, of course, stands in the way of, of, of transitional justice in a, in a full sense. The, the, only, the only problem with that, just to, to come back, is that sometimes public good was equated with um, confirming property rights. So, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of like also, um, I alluded to um, even this, this issue of trying to hold a referendum on German rearmament. Of course, that was prevented because of fears of, of what the results would be, um, but also the issue of um, the coal industry coming under, under public ownership and how there, that a, a referendum was also prevented on that may well have been public good, but this was challenging British and American views about, um, interestingly enough, um, about public ownership of utilities. So I just wanted to throw in um, uh, some research that I'd done uh, during the post-communist period of a uh, number of court cases uh, concerning uh, w jobs and restitution. And it's very interesting that a number of the courts, the constitutional courts at that time, 
uh, equate um, uh, change in those uh, with respect to those rights as property rights and that and and indicate that that rule of law would mandate um, uh, 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 an approach that would be unchanging uh, because there could be you know a chaotic approach to uh, uh, property and this would be a disincentive to investment going forward. I wrote a piece, uh, Paradoxes, in the, I think it was in the Rule of Law. In any event, I th it's interesting because almost anything can be considered a property right and including an, expecta an expectation, for example, in a statute of limitations on a crime. That you know the idea that re, re you know uh, reinstating uh, the possibility of a, of a criminal offense was considered tampering with a property right, a right of repose. So um, you know this gets to Nick's work and some of the other references that that the panelists have made. So yeah, yeah. I guess I think um, yeah. I also want to say thank you for inviting me on this panel. I was also so terribly nervous. Um, so thank you for organizing this really great panel, um, Ezra. I think what's interesting about my piece is that I'm moving away from the state as the only entity to be involved in transitional justice. Um, and that I see these cultural um, developments on the ground as a form of transitional justice as well and reparative work um, that requires a reckoning, a different type of reckoning. Mm -hmm. um, I think after we, you know, when we think about German history, we certainly think about the Holocaust, we think about the, the Venda post Venda. Um, and I think what's interesting about the emergence of the Black German movement in the particular time that it, um, that, um, that it comes on the scene, so to speak, is that it really reorients um, us to recognize the colonial legacies, how those colonial legacies are underpinning how Germans see themselves, how they see others, how they're dictating their, their diplomatic relationships with um, Africa, especially Germany's involvement in the um, South African apartheid. Um, and so I think this is what's so interesting about you know, cultural events like the Black History Month and also organizations like Bo Berlin Postcolonial, which I think was created in 2007, is that they're really trying to reorient um, what, how Germany's um, standing of itself should be changed and how we, how colonialism was instrumental in shaping what Germany is today. When we think about Edekamacht or all of these sort of, you know, stores that are directly linked to the sort of colonial period. Um, and so I think that's what's so fascinating about looking at transitional justice from the bottom up um, is that this is a site for, you know, not only reimagining what um, justice can look like, but it also really doesn't, um, it doesn't necessarily presuppose that the state is the only entity that can um, engage in this type of reparative justice work. Can I ask Tiffany a question about this? <laughs> because it, it, it goes to this, you know, some of the themes in the panel. And that is, I, I agree with you, and certainly with respect to Latin America, civil society played a very big role in, in beating the drum until you could get the society, the state um, uh, supporting civil society. But I have a question about today in the US, which is that, you know, I, I've, I'm among scholars supporting reparations and also supporting um, state, you know, official documentation of uh, slavery, segregation, and mass incarceration and the numbers, getting the, the actual numbers. And, and um, the reaction that one gets from some, some quarters is that look at civil society, it's so polarized, it's so shrill that um, we can't imagine having a congressional agreement uh, on this. Now, my view is that, it's, that, we, that it has to be taken away right now from the burden of it being the struggle on the street that that in fact the violence of January 6 which made it very clear that we you know we can't continue this way my view is that we def that we need the state uh, that the state postponed for a very long time uh, reckoning with this and that that the momentum is coming from civil society but it shouldn't just stay there so i don't know i wondered what your thoughts were about that yeah yeah uh, and anyone else who, yeah yeah, Ruzi, that's a really good comment slash question. Um, I think that I should, I didn't mention in the talk, but um, they're getting sort of um, state funding from Berlin for some of these events. So there is buy-in from the state um, and they're applying for funding to, you know, to um, uh, have some um, financial support to put on these events. 
but I think you're right that like, I think it's a, a combination of both the, you know, the, the push from civil society at large to really shape what the state can do in terms of affecting serious change. Um, and I think we see that today with discussions about, um, we're seeing discussions about um, the removal of Rasa from the Grundgesetz, um, what, what are the implications of that? Um, we're, we're also seeing, you know, more concerted efforts to um, talk about uh, how Germany can maybe create more anti-racist legislation. I know Berlin is one of the cities that was able to sort of do this, but a sort of nationwide um, um, legislation. So I think you're right that it's basically, uh, it's, it's a need from both, you know, the bottom level of sort of on the streets, but also um, working with sort of state officials to really affect this change. And I think that's an example of like that anti-racist legislation that's in Berlin, that's huge. That took activists on the ground working in conversation with um, you know, individuals in the state. Yeah, now that uh, Ruti has uh, rebrought the question of uh, the US and Rebecca, uh, you also uh, mentioned um, US reparations debate uh, going on uh, at the moment. Um, I was also reminded uh, of um, let's say not too long ago, how uh, German transitional justice um, attempts have been received uh, or, uh, in the US or their repercussions in the US. Um, there was also um, the argument by many scholars that the German case uh, has served as somewhat of a screen memory, um, like Miriam Hansen's argument and so on, um, like a relatively more comforting memory as if uh, US citizens do not have to um, Reckon with their own crimes and so on. So the German case and how it acted as a screen memory in US has been a concern for um, some scholars <laughs> in the very recent past. And I wonder if um, the debates or the Nahesi Coates uh, Atlantic article that you mentioned, Rebecca, whether um, the case is being shifted with the reparations uh, debate and if you have any comments on, if anyone has any comments on that. Uh, well, I would just say that the U.S. sees it. Sorry, sees itself as as itself post-colonial. You know, we and we and we were on the good side in World War II. So there's, you know, there's, a, a, you know, and and some people just say, well, we, you know, the North won the Civil War. So the idea is that somehow the war settles it, and that we, you know, that we fight for liberation. I don't know. There are a lot of tropes here that where where we see ourselves as kind of opposite to, you know, the European history on on empire and on some of these uh, debates. It's very interesting. The U.S. may be seen as empire by others, but we 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 keep alive a different flame uh, uh, in terms of world history. Yeah, yeah. I, just a thought. Rebecca, I think you unmuted yourself. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that um, it's so interesting because I I don't see um, Germany as this um, absolute positive model either, as you can probably tell from my comments. But but I think the thinking about the role of the state is an interesting one, and and Tiffany's point in some ways. Um, brings us down to the role of the municipality versus the state, um, and that that's a that's a stage closer to the street level and and to civil society, um, and what's possible to do um, with municipal governments or even um, um, city states, if you will, um, is is sometimes not possible to do on a on a national level. So um, it it also reminded me that some people think of January sixth as I would call it uncivil society, but it, it was not state sponsored, although obviously like a pogrom, um, somewhat sanctioned. <laughs> so um, we, we have about 15, 20 more minutes, uh, so uh, Max. Uh, so I, I would like to read some of the questions uh, that are in the Q&A box and for those who have raise their hands and uh, please write your question uh, because we don't have the technical ability to make you speak. Uh, so uh, there's a very long question by Leslie Adelson. Actually, it's, it's a three-part part question uh, and let me read that. Um, thank you uh, all for such stellar presentations. A few questions immediately come to mind. One uh, for Ruti. Fritz Bauer, was a German Jewish jurist who played key roles in launching Germany's Auschwitz trials and others. 
and also in helping Israel find Ahmed in Argentina. Uh, does he also play any role in the legal conceptualization of transitional justice today? Two, uh, thinking Nick and Tiffany's talks together, doesn't the Treaty of Versailles explicitly address the state-to-state -state ownership of the skull of a particular uh, resistance leader? What role will human remains play in conceptual approaches to expropriation? And three, for all three, for all of, um, for all of you, uh, Tiffany explicitly stressed the cultural dimensions of reparative justice, in addition to moral and political and financial dimensions. How would the other panelists see the role of uh, cultural work too um, in practicing as well as conceptualizing reparative justice? Thank you all very much. So um, I guess uh, whoever wants to go first um, can start. There are questions for everyone. Since it's so historical, uh, the Fritz Bauer. So I love, there's a recent film, People versus Fritz Bauer, and I show it in my classes on transitional justice. So yes, uh, um, and, and, but it's uh, complicated, right? Because uh, the, the story for, of Fritz Bauer, as was mentioned, um, you know, fighting for justice at the end of the war, trying to prosecute uh, crimes uh, uh, of, of Germany's uh, Reich, he, um, it's a heroic story, uh, but they try to blackmail him uh, because he was gay and, you know, in addition to being Jewish, so it was a very difficult uh, task, so it was postponed, and in fact, he wanted to prosecute Eichmann in Germany, and Israel would have been happy to do that. Uh, uh, and there were negotiations at the time before Eichmann was found. The, the, it was a question of whether Eichmann or Mengele would be found first in Argentina. I'm well acquainted with this history because my family comes from Argentina, from family that escaped from ha Hamburg. And, um, and actually I have family that was involved in the Eichmann case uh, um, and, and tailing him. And uh, because they knew Spanish and they were sent back by Israel uh, to, to um, uh, Argentina. So it's all very complicated. It's a heroic story, but in the end, uh, it would be postponed. Uh, it would be take pushing from a variety of actors. So on the one hand, it points to the role of individuals, of heroic individuals who cared about justice. On the other hand, Israel would have its rare case. Uh, they did not end up uh, prosecuting um, uh, many Nazi cases. You have the case of Eichmann, uh, which is hugely uh, uh, and, and exaggerated in its uh, by Hannah Arendt and so on. Uh, you have a handful of collaborator cases, but you know, in the end, it would be Israel and then back to Germany. So I think um, it shows the significance of resistance in Germany. Uh, in that immediate generation, uh, justice would come from el elsewhere. But the importance, I guess, and this goes back to the exchange with Tiffany, the importance of individuals and of imaginings uh, by individuals who had a stake in the matter. And he certainly did, uh, having been both gay and Jewish, yeah. yeah. And students really resonate to that. I would say that films of, about individuals and novels, this is what sticks with people. You know, if you have masses of graves and corpses, this does not uh, resonate. But the stories of individuals uh, who took, you know, certain steps uh, and, and, and their particular intersubjectivity, this is, has been important in, in my classes, yeah, and going forward. Um, <clears throat> I'm also happy to uh, take the second question that, that Leslie posed. Uh, yeah, great. And I already wanted to say something uh, in relation to what Tiffany mentioned about, about wake work and the, these the, um, human remains of, um, in, in Namibia, because um, as far as I'm uh, aware, there's no explicit provision for that uh, in any of these early 20th century treaties, like the Versailles Treaty. Um, and I don't know enough about, about specifically the, the case of human remains uh, as a form of property, but there are in the um, Versailles Treaty many stipulations about living things actually that can be transferred. So there are extensive provisions about the amount of livestock, for example, and horses that the Germans need to give to other European countries, Belgium, um, uh, France, Serbia, etc. 
uh, as a form of restitution. So interestingly, living things were considered also to be uh, animals as a, were considered a form of, of possible reparations. Um, I think the, the issue that you have with um, assimilating the Versailles logic to the case of the colonial um, a, a relationship between Germany and Namibia is that um, the uh, Treaty of Versailles transferred German colonial property to other European countries. And so, right, these, these two layers in the history of property colonial property that was just effectively uh, dispossessed or taken from native populations was then seen as a legitimate form of Western property that could be given to other Western countries in order to settle inter-European disputes. And I think that that really is the, the kind of big tension uh, that we run up against. Um, and it, interestingly, uh, as I mentioned, it persists in Namibia itself where uh, the interstate dimension and the domestic struggle for land redistribution are two separate and intertwined discussions uh, at the moment. Hi, Leslie, thanks for coming. Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, I think the question that um, Nick just answered, I think it's, yeah, I don't know if it's, I don't, I, things that I've read so far, I don't see the skulls as being a part of this, um, a, a, as being constituted as part of property, but um, clearly my sort of this new idea about wake work is um, is a bit more co-ate, so I have to do a little bit more digging to see if there's anything that um, that reference it. But I also think that you're right, that I, my, my whole point was to really sort of stress the the cultural dimensions that, that, that are also quite very, very much tied to the political for, for Black Germans um, and sort of pushing the sort of colonial legacy as um, um, something that is oftentimes, sort of, you know, uh, ignored um, and not even sort of addressed fully. Um, so I think, I think it's, it, I think it, I'm going to be sort of looking at, uh, looking at a little bit more um, sort of the sort of a dynamic in terms of sort of Nam Namibian skulls. Um, especially sort of um, artifacts, um, fossils. I mean, I think that I, I wonder the sort of distinction between sort of human skulls versus sort of um, um, fossils, primordial fossils, where that plays, is that also a form of property? Um, there's sort of discussions, ongoing discussions now about that um, and sort of the sort of larger discussions that are going on in terms of um, museums in Europe more broadly. Um, and how does that fit in? Um, and so I'm, I'm doing more research on that um, and clearly, I, I'm going to do more research on a lot of things, but this is this seems a bit bit much more sort of prescient for me and very interesting in terms of how we define um, restorative justice and redefining restorative justice. Um, so I hope that answers it a bit. <clears throat> yeah, on the and the, on the museums, um, Humboldt Forum, for instance, is going uh, through a lot of discussions and actually the German curators have some sort of a manifesto about how to repatriate objects and so on. So that's definitely uh, something that's very much public. Um, yes, Rebecca? Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say in terms of Leslie's question about um, cultural work, um, national identity, of course, is very much built on cultural identity. And so it's hard to really parse those apart in many ways. But I was also thinking about ongoing art restitution um, and art restitution cases that, that that is often conceived of return of personal property when in fact it could, depending on how we understand art, um, it could be perceived very much as cultural heritage and cultural good and then it allows us to bring these broader themes together. Um, yeah, there's another question about uh, art uh, by Elke Siegel. Uh, she was, she's wondering if you would like to speak about the role of art, not necessarily art restitution and uh, restitution of bones and so on, but uh, she's thinking particularly of theater um, and the theater as space, uh, as a place for justice. And she mentions, for instance, the Congo Tribunal Theater. So I wonder if um, those cultural spheres uh, do have, um, an impact in obviously reparative justice, but also in um, mobilizing more material reparations and compensations. Anyone? Can I, I just uh, would start with uh, the piece by William Kentridge, which is a, a theater in a box uh, 
uh, which really was one of the first uh, uh, images uh, uh, surrounding the Namibian re uh, requests uh, uh, for reparations, 2005. I saw it for the first time at the Deutsche Guggenheim then, and uh, it's remarkable. It's a remarkable play. And what theater can do is um, reframe the issues. And so what he does is he juxtaposes the persecution, first uh, the hunt for the rhinoceros, okay, and the mm -hmm. persecution of the of the arero, uh, uh, which would later be uh, 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 reference, you know, would lead directly to similar claims about Jews, and um, you know, and, and Tiffany alluded to this: the use of concentration camps, the use of um, biological difference, the idea of of creating these differences. He reimagines it uh, and juxtaposes it against, as I said, the Enlightenment with the uh, use of science and and Mozart. And so that's what theater can do: is re reframe and and push the viewer to understand, you know, this kind of this these hidden archival images, as he calls them, uh, uh, about colonialism. I would also think of the the theater of um, coming out of Latin America. Uh, Ariel Dorfman's piece, Death and the Maiden, uh, does something similar talking about the uh, enlightenment and uh, the um, the respect of the uh, Latin American military for uh, their Prussian uh, forebears and that he reimagines the relationship of the perpetrator and the victim in that piece where the victim controls the perpetrator who's the truth for it's not for the two of them they know about the attack, they know about the abuses. He forces the bystander. We all become bystanders in the theater, right? We all become, and we all have to interrogate our role, right, as as viewers. So I, I think theater can be great that way. It really can push uh, uh, those watching to uh, consider the role of society during, you know, persecution and afterwards in in the kind of retellings we're doing. Even today, those who are viewing, right? You, you know, this is a Bit of a show, right? And so it, it forces the viewer to interrogate and to encounter these issues in a different way. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, uh, Ruti, but I also think that that theater can help to reify some of these categories. And here I'm thinking about Brett Bailey, a South African artist who had an exhibition in 2010, really sort of um, in which he um, reified categories of inferiority um, and anti-blackness in while simultaneously uh, uh, trying to sort of challenge the viewer or or, or um, alienate the viewer. Um, and so these are, and I think about theater of the oppressed. So I'm thinking about a tradition from Brazil as well, sort of how, uh, how it is important for reframing, but I also caution us to really recognize when these moments of you know artistic expression are helping to reify categories that are problematic and not seeing I think this is where it's important to recognize our own positionality when pursuing these these you know creative ventures and endeavors that really we are you know we are not you know I am not Namibian um, you know Brett Bailey is not Namibian he's from South Africa he also has an interesting legacy in terms of you know the racial politics in South Africa and Namibia's place in South Africa so I think that um, it, it, it it occupies both strains that it's it's a moment for reflection it's also a moment for like disturbance to sort of jar us to really interrogate um, interrogate the questions that we've been asking, but it also can reify um, categories that are problematic. Um, so maybe we might end with one more question, uh, which is to Tiffany by um, Anetta Alexandridis. Um, does or how does the Black German movement engage with the history of Germans' reparations and Jewish claims in their own agenda? That's a very good question, Aneta. Um, I, in terms of seeing some of this documentation, I'm not seeing them talking about reparations in the same way when referencing or discussing um, the Jewish case. What I'm mostly seeing is how they're trying to address this issue of anti-Semitism as a part of this larger discourse about racism. Oftentimes the discussions about anti-Semitism are separated from discussions about racism, anti-Black racism. And I think what they're trying to push is for a larger entanglement with the two and how they're connected. 
Um, and it's less about, um, you know, reparations that, um, that Jews were able to um, acquire and more about some of the discursive, um, discursive underpinnings of the German nation and how racism is really key to that. Um, and so, and then at a sort of, you know, basic level too, they're going to like, they're having, you know, um, and, and they're sort of feminist, um, West, West German Jewish feminists who are connecting with black German feminists and they're trying to really, you know, it's a, a very much an Alcinendos at song in which they're really trying to challenge what, um, what race means. There's a lot of tension between the two in terms of um, meeting with Black Germans and their use of Black Germans. So I think for um, these sort of West German feminists, Black German and Jewish feminists, um, they're really sort of coming coming together and trying to sort of um, really disentangle some of these issues in ways that are, lead to more fruitful understanding of what solidarity can mean. Um, so it's not less, they're not focused on the monetary um, discussions per se in the sources that I've seen. Um, they're more so um, talking about sort of um, some of the material ba backlash of, you know, racism and anti-Semitism and how they need to work together to, um, to deal with those um, issues. Thank you very much. Does anyone want to add uh, final comments on each other or on any of the questions? Well, I was thinking about how, um, you know, the reparations debates uh, and, and Jewish reparations did inform um, uh, Boris Bitger's work, uh, one of the first uh, claims for African American reparations. I, but one can get locked in. And I don't, you know, I, I tend not to use the word lessons. It's more like here are historical instances. They don't necessarily, you know, coincide. Uh, it can be informative, and I think that's part of what we're talking about today on the panel. But for example, American reckoning will take an American form. It's you know we, you have so many phases of persecution in America, and and having you know the national and the local, as was discussed. So I think that these can be informative uh, historical instances, but not necessarily they're you know it's not necessarily. Uh, um, co coinciding or dispositive. Also, someone used the term before thinking backwards and um, thinking backwards, thinking forwards. It's true that once we have terms, we tend to revisit history. And so, you know, the, in Namibia today, you know, they're raising issues that may, may would have been framed differently perhaps uh, 50 years ago or 100 years ago. So I think that's interesting. And, and we probably need a bigger vocabulary to think about that, about how the legal terms, right? The idea of finding that something is a claim or a right or an injustice, using the language of injustice when something was natural before, um, you know, does raise issues and changes expectations, but that's inevitable, right? That's the march of history and it's the march for greater liberation and greater human actualization and dignity. So, uh, it may be complicated for historians, but I think it's part of the uh, of, of of the future of the future of, of, of humanity. So um, those are some thoughts uh, that I have, you know, just thinking about uh, the, really this wonderful panel. Yeah. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Who? Nicholas? Nick? Sorry. Yeah, well, there's just one thing, actually. Um, because uh, I, I was also in, in the course of the discussion about uh, different and new ways of thinking about restitution, reminded of uh, some of the great work being done right now by Anna Carla, who uh, is researching the actual uh, reconstruction efforts that were undertaken in the 20s as part of reparations. And it's a little known aspect that one of the ways in which Germany could actually pay back its debts was to have its construction firms do actual reconstruction work, physical work to rebuild buildings, canals, all sorts of public infrastructure. So I think even in terms of the built environment, right, we can think about monuments or those sorts of spaces. But I think in uh, the post-colonial reparations discussion, that actually could be a very concrete and useful example to think with uh, about how to, uh, yeah, think about material reparations, not just in terms of money or property transfers, but labor and effort, yeah. Yeah, and, or but I should say as an architect that rebuilding uh, buildings as they were exactly in the past, like it was done in the Humboldt Forum, is um, <laughs> not rightly so a popular idea among the architects. And I agree, it has to be some uh, other form of <laughs> reparations when it comes to um, that. Uh, okay, well, I would like to thank everyone, unless um, anyone uh, has 
yet another uh, last word. Um, I would like to thank everyone um, for uh, joining uh, this wonderful panel um, and for the discussion and uh, all the our attendees uh, for uh, asking uh, the questions. And let me share my screen uh, for um, giving you uh, a bit of an information uh, of what is to come. So this is uh, our uh, series panel. Um, we have already organized these panels and we uh, still have three more panels to go. And on March 29th, we will have a panel uh, USSR to post-Soviet Russia reparations uh, or repression for Stalin's victims. So I hope uh, you join that uh, as well. So thank you so much again. Uh, this was a wonderful, very informative, very inspiring uh, and a very stimulating panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.